Okay, dear goodness gracious, there we go again with the microphone. All right, I am Dr. Annette Farovich, and I am here with my our second episode on depression and behavior. And this second episode is actually called Behavior and Depression. And the second episode is on behavior and depression. And the reason why we want to take a close-up look at this, even though that is the title of our series, we want to take, we want to make sure that we're taking a close-up look at uh, how behavior actually impacts our depression. Because it's very easy for us to be able to take a pharmaceutical. But like I had talked about last week, Even though it's easier for us to take an antidepressant or for easier for us to take a pharmaceutical, um, one of the reasons why we want to study and look at the behavioral impacts on depression is because they are much more natural. We have a natural inclination to look for meaning and purpose in our lives. And in doing so... And in doing so, this marches us out of depression in very natural ways. Where antidepressants don't work naturally with your brain's chemistry, they alter your brain's chemistry. And that's what medicine does. It looks to alter your biology or your chemistry in order to change something that is creating or causing a disease. Here, what we believe at Healthy Mind, Body, Spirit is that what we really need to do is focus our energies on those things that are most natural for taking us out of depression. And because we know that behavior and our behavior and instinct is for meaning and purpose, then our search for meaning and purpose can very often take us out of our depressive Um, thoughts and our depressive behaviors and even then change the chemistry of our brain. So that, of course, is what we're looking to do when we are looking to um, address depression. We talked last week about uh, some very important things and I just want to go over some of those things that we talked last week about. Last week, our discussion was on what is depression, if you remember. And when we were looking at that, some of the topics that we were talking about were, uh, first of all, some of the main points that I want to make sure that we uh, remember and address is, first of all, we know that anxiety is a precursor to depression. So what does that mean? It means that anxiety actually leads to depression. And this is important to know because, once again, we can address actual anxious behaviors. It's the reason why I have episode number two, addressing behaviors, because anxiety is associated with behaviors. And so what we want to take a look at then is uh, the anxiety that precedes depression. And by addressing that anxiety first, we can hopefully um, uh Uh, forego experiencing depression. Okay, our second thing, an important point that I wanted to make sure that I talked about with you was uh, that there are environmental uh, components that also uh, interact with our genetic components, our biology, our DNA. And in fact, relative to personality traits, it's the environment. It is the places that we live, the things that we experience that actually play a bigger part in our depression than our biology or our chemistry. It is our environment that changes the bio. It is the environment that changes our biology. It's the environment that changes our chemistry. And so that's why we want to focus on behaviors because it's the impact of that environment that then changes. Therefore, the impact of our behaviors 
behaviors, the impact of our thinking, the impact of the way that we approach life can also change our behaviors in positive ways. And that's exactly what we want to take a look at today. Okay, so that was important point number two from episode number one, what is depression? Uh, Important point number three is, is that these environmental conditions change our DNA, which is what I already mentioned. So environmental conditions are important and they change our DNA. Number four, motivation is key to depression. If you recall, last week we talked about some of the um, perceptions that we have relative to things like whether conditions are threatening or whether we feel they're challenging. When conditions are threatening, we have a tendency to interpret those as being more um, anxiety-provoking and then therefore can lead to depressive behaviors like hopelessness and helplessness, right? Okay, so what we want to do is figure out ways that we stay motivated. And that's the important part of this um, presentation that I have. It's the important part of this episode that it is partly our perceptions that influence our motivation and therefore it's behaviors then that can also alter our perceptions. All right, so that's important. If you remember, I talked last week. If you haven't seen it, watch the episode. I talked last week about mice who were depressed mice and they had opportunities to get delicious food. And uh, when it was easy, they chose the delicious food. But when they had to make an effort and climb some ladders in order to get the delicious food, the depressed mice did not get the delicious food. What was the importance of this? The importance of this was, was that they still preferred the delicious food. They just weren't motivated enough to get it. And so therefore, it's it's important to understand how important behaviors are in influencing our motivation. Okay, so that was point number four. Point number five is, Even depressed individuals can enjoy. And so that was important in what we noted from that that experiment uh, with the mice. So they still can enjoy that delicious food. They just weren't motivated to get it. Okay, the next important point that we got from last week's episode is that uh, meaning and purpose are key because those drives our engagement and they drive our behaviors. So meaning and purpose are key. The next point important, the next important point that we made from last week's video was that uh, depression is, um, um, inordinately affecting Generation Z. So disproportionately, Generation Z individuals are feeling uh, the effects of much of these environmental changes, and they haven't quite developed the coping skills that they need in order to overcome some of these um these barriers that they've seen, some of these obstacles. We're going to talk somewhat about grit later on. Grit is an important behavior that we need in order to motivate ourselves and believe that we are able to accomplish those important things that we want to accomplish. Okay, so this is self-efficacy, that when we have obstacles, we build grit and the confidence that we can overcome. We're going to talk about self-efficacy coming up. Then the last point that we made in last week's video on what is depression is that behaviors get us into our problem problems and therefore behaviors can get us out of our problems. So, Those were the important points that I wanted to remind you of as we go into then this next um, 
episode on behavior and depression and see how this kind of folds into and and emphasizes the importance of still changing our brain as as well as changing our behaviors which changes then our physiology and all kinds of things in positive ways and we're doing those things things naturally in ways that they actually work with our body chemistry so that's what's so important about this episode So thank you for joining me and uh, let's move on. Okay, so for today's agenda, the first thing that I want to talk about is engagement and what that is. So so I'm not going to get into it right now. We'll talk about it as soon as uh, we we talk about what today's agenda is. So uh, engagement is the first thing that I'm going to talk to you about. What is it and why is it important? Number two, I'm going to talk about brain behavior. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about the placebo effect and what is the placebo effect. So just a little short introduction to brain behavior. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about brain behavior when we talk about antidepressants. All right, then what we're going to do is just talk about some of the positive behaviors that we can engage in that will change our brain. And we're going to talk just a little bit about the negative behaviors behaviors and uh, introduce you to a little bit to what's called rumination if you're not aware of it. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. So the first thing that I want, I said that I wanted to talk to you about was engagement. And we're going to talk about what is engagement. And there are three things that actually um, are theoretically con- Uh, contributors or variables to what we call real happiness or authentic happiness. Now, when we're looking at this, I want you you to, I want you to also know that um, there, there is a theory and this theory is from Martin Seligman who talks about authentic happiness, but he talks about it from a few different perspectives and has added other components into this authentic happiness theory of his, but for our purposes, we want to look at those first three important components to authentic happiness. And so there we are with number one is the pleasant life. And so if we want to be truly happy and feel truly happy, what we need is we actually need pleasures of the senses. Pleasures of the senses include things like delicious pieces of cake or pizza. They include things like uh, touch and sexual stimulation. They include things like uh, a bubble bath. They include things like all kinds of things that please our uh, senses is what they do. Okay, so that is considered to be the pleasant life. We do need those things for authentic happiness. It's important for us to have a delicious meal. It's important for us to get good sleep. It's important for us to fulfill all of those sensations, those sensual pleasures. Number two is the good life or engagement in life. We need to be active in life. We need to be involved in life. One of the things that is clear that through this pandemic we have been unable to do is we really have been unable to engage in life like we've wanted to and like we've become accustomed to. We haven't been able to go out and socialize. We haven't even been able to hold our grandchildren or comfort those people who are sick. And all of that engages us in life. They are important for both our uh, um, cognitive uh, growth and development, feelings of mastery and self-esteem, but they also build things like relationships as well, which we know is our most important need. The third component of authentic happiness is the meaningful life. And I've talked several times about this. The meaningful life is what is our drive to get something more than just our physical pleasures. So both the good life and the meaningful life are important uh, for what we call eudaimonic happiness. And eudaimonic happiness, according to Aristotle, is being true to yourself fulfilling those kinds of things that make you, you. 
with your unique talents and your unique skills and your unique perspective, your unique knowledge that you have, your unique experiences. All of those things add up to be able to give you something to offer the world, right? And in offering those things to the world, you feel important, you feel that you've make, made contributions, and then therefore you are true to who you are meant to be. That is what Aristotle called eudaimonic happiness. Hedonic happiness, pleasures of the senses, though that, that hedonic happiness is uh, gives us similar pleasures, but outcomes are not the same. So hedonic happiness, pleasures of the senses, eudaimonic happiness is engagement and purpose in life, okay? For the purposes of this discussion, we are going to be talking about the good life engagement in life because engagement is the behavior that uh, gives us the benefit of the drive for meaning and purpose okay all right um, up above there if you were wondering about the smiles that we have there that's a great way to be able to measure authentic happiness if individuals are truly happy and we see that most of the individuals actually score themselves as above average in happiness okay all right let's move on now what is actual engagement though? What's a great way to take a look at this psychologically? And when we break it down psychologically, it helps us better attack what it is that we need to attack. And what I mean by that is what behaviors do we need to engage in that will give me the biggest bang for my buck to help reduce depression and increase feelings of happiness? And that's really what we're gonna talk about today. There are certain behaviors that can lead to less happiness, but still increases. Where can we actually really focus our attentions to get the most meaning and purpose and engagement in life? So uh, you can see here then we've got uh, this chart that has two continuums. On the bottom continuum, what we consider the x-axis, are abilities. So these are abilities that go from low to high. So you might want to think about some things that you, you might want to think about things that uh, you are, you have low abilities in, right? No natural talents at all. And then you might want to think about things that you have high ability in. And then this way you can really begin to apply what I'm saying here. Okay. So um, that's on the x-axis, abilities from low to high. On the, what's considered the y-axis, the vertical axis here are challenges. So you again see challenges go from low to high. Here when we're talking about challenges, what we want to consider is we want to consider the task. So abilities are related to me. Challenges are related to the task. And so what we see when we have a wonderful balance between high abilities and high challenges of the task, we have the goal of engagement, which is in this yellow kind of diamond shape or arrow shape, uh, which is called flow. So when we are feeling flow, Another way to, to look at this is to call it being in the zone. So when we're feeling flow, what we are is there is a feeling of sort of suspended time so that uh, your abilities are being challenged at the perfect level that they can be challenged and both of them are very high which then leads to things like feelings of mastery and feelings of confidence in your skills so you can see how engagement and building things like flow can decrease depression because what it's doing is increasing your confidence in the challenges that you have Remember what I said initially is that what I'm trying to teach you is coping strategies, coping skills. 
And so we can see then that when we, whether or not we manufacture it or seek it out in our employment or seek it out in our everyday challenges, what we want to seek out are those challenges that are best developing and best exemplify, kind of boost up, right, magnify our talents. So we don't need to put energy and effort into trying to develop those skills that have nothing to do with our true talents because what that does is it creates frustration is what it does. So let's take a look at those other areas on that chart and see, we can see right away here that we can have anxiety. And remember, anxiety, we said, is the precursor to depression. And so if that's the case, what should we do here related to anxiety? And the thing here uh, that we're looking at that's creating the anxiety here is when we have low abilities, yet our challenges are high. And this is interesting because uh, we want to uh, challenge ourselves certainly and many of us are challenging ourselves by uh, getting an education going to school um, trying to work around this pandemic um, trying to still make ends meet trying to grasp changing laws trying to grasp changing politics and and all kinds of changing technology that's creating great chaos for us right and many of us are feeling inadequate to meet those demands so currently we are seeing that we have lots of challenges and many of us are feeling low in our abilities to meet those challenges and as we can see that creates anxiety where we're saying then that we want to focus our efforts if we want behaviors to slowly walk us out of our feelings of depression, then what we need to do is focus our attention on those challenges that we have great ability to address, right? That we have great ability to be able to solve is what we want to do. So again, what that ends up doing then is it ends up giving us a feeling of confidence and feelings of what is called self-efficacy, right? All right, so let's just take a couple, a look at a few more of those to kind of round out our understanding of what flow is and feeling in the zone. So you can see here then that uh, we have more worry when the challenges are are fewer. So we can see here then how we might be feeling relative to this wheel that we've got here, or we call it a circumplex. Where are you in this circumplex? Are you feeling that you are worried, but maybe not anxious? Are you feeling anxious along with great arousal as well? This then can end up creating some health problems later on. And that's what I want to talk to you about in some of our future videos where we've got a video coming up on loneliness and health. So we'll be looking at the, the schedule a little bit later on. Um, but again, apathy, let's take a look at this. Apathy is where you have no emotional arousal at all, right? So it is... Uh, less than boredom because boredom actually does have some kind of arousal even though it is depressed um still depressed feelings apathy is actually in the negative direction when we feel that both uh um Abilities are low and challenges are low. This is where we have a tendency to not have any feelings. Again, like boredom is actually a feeling. So this is where we end up kind of uh, checking out of life, where we have no interest in life. So where are you on that? And remember, what we want to take away from here is we certainly can be very relaxed when we have high abilities but low challenges. But what that avoids then 
and what that prevents us from experiencing is that eudaimonic happiness, that really great feelings of engagement, and even over here, feelings of control are also in there as well. That's how we end up getting a feeling of confidence. However, it's interesting because it's not all about control, is it? It's not always the assuredness of full control, is it? Because what we're saying is, is that there's a, t that there's a, uh, a chance for failure, right? If the challenge is high, there's a chance for failure. But what I'm doing in flow is, is I'm sharpening my skills is what I'm doing. I am mastering the task. And remember, when we talked about mastering before, look at my videos on self-esteem if you want to know more about mastering. What we've said is, is with mastering, we end up feeling uh, um, less helplessness, right? So when we don't master a task, but just learn it for the sake of uh, getting a grade, for example, we don't master the task, we end, that ends up leading to helplessness. And helplessness, as we said last week, leads to hopelessness, which leads to depression. That's an important um, relationship. It's an important linear relationship that you want to understand. Where does the anxiety come in? The anxiety comes in in feeling helpless, in learning helplessness over time. Okay? All right. Let's move on. Now, what I want to talk a little bit about is I want to talk a little bit about giving you an introduction to um, a little bit about why antidepressants may not work as well as behaviors. That what we have found is, is that people experience what's called a placebo effect. And what is a placebo effect? A placebo effect is where people actually receive a treatment and they actually improve. By all measures, we see improvement. And so individuals, for example, were in a surgical group where they had arthro arthroscopic, arthroscopic surgery on their knees and some of them, half of them were assigned to get the surgery. The other half were told that they had the surgery. They made incisions on their knees, but they didn't actually receive the surgery. And what did we find out? We found out that there was no difference in pain that was experienced by the two different groups and no difference in actual recovery times. And so what this is saying then is that it's kind of a mind over matter kind of a experience. And we have seen this placebo effect in all kinds of different conditions. We know that individuals who receive, um, who have received Prozac, that more than 75% of those individuals saw improvement in both groups, in both the Prozac group and also the placebo group. So they were seeing the same kinds of um, um, effectiveness in reducing a depression in placebo as they had seen in the actual individuals who received uh, Prozac. We've also seen this with um, migraines as well. Individuals who believed that they were getting medication for the migraine headache uh, saw improvements, about 50% improvement, not the full 100% improvement though. So we can see that if the treatment is actually effective, what we end up doing is we test individuals in both a placebo and a treatment group. And if we see that the treatment group has significantly more improvement over the placebo group, then we see that it's an effective treatment. We are not seeing that with antidepressants. We are seeing approximately the same rate of effectiveness in antidepressants as we see in the placebo. Now, there are exceptions to this that you should know about, and the exceptions I've mentioned before, and those exceptions are uh, in the, the realm of those individuals who have more extreme cases of depression. 
And also remember that this is a probability. And the probability means that it doesn't happen in all cases. It doesn't mean that 100% of the cases who received a placebo felt uh, the same as those individuals who were not in the placebo. And that 100% of the individuals who were in the treatment group would have gotten the same kinds of um, uh, um, results as those individuals did in the uh, placebo group. It does not. It doesn't mean that 100% of the time that you are going to see those effects, placebo effects, for example. Um, however, it does substantially happen, and we've seen these placebo effects over and over again when it comes to antidepressants. We don't see them in more severe cases. We don't. We we do see results with medication in, in individuals who have um, uh, severe major depression. We also uh, and who are suicidal individuals who we consider bipolar individuals who are schizophrenic. Individuals who are certainly more extreme in their mental illnesses, we are seeing effective uh, pharmaceutical um, results. So it's not that there are no results related to pharmaceutical uh, medication. It's just that um, medication takes a singular route to addressing our mental illness or disease in general. And I like to take a route that is more natural and then see um, what we might be able to eliminate relative to pharmaceuticals. That's my general approach to medicine. So that's a placebo effect. We see it considerably with antidepressants. Okay, so the next thing here is, uh, again, what is a placebo? And what I want to show you here is uh, differences then between, and you can see what each one of these columns are indicating because we have a legend down here that describes each one of those columns. And so what we have here is right here in the middle, TAU treatment as usual. What are we measuring here? It, it is a depression inventory. So Hamilton rating scale for depression is a depression inventory. And this column here then is measuring then after treatment as usual scores for individuals on this Hamilton depression inventory. So those individuals who got just the usual psychotherapy ended up having still the greatest levels of depression. You can see here that there was barely a difference between individuals who had regular psychotherapy and medication. And in fact, we are likely seeing the difference here, which is uh, slight, but there is a difference, likely can be due to things like the placebo effect. Here, what this PPT is, is uh, this is traditional psychotherapy using actually positive this is positive psychotherapy and positive psychotherapy is using these positive behaviors in order to decrease depression so these are the positive behaviors that i've been talking about and um, we can see then that those were the most successful in reducing depression scores on this hamilton inventory Okay, so who are the antidepressants helping? Uh, please join me next Sunday at 4 o'clock, October 31st on Halloween, where we will discuss antidepressants and who they actually are helping and whether or not they're helping significantly. Okay, so moving on. Let's take a look at then, I'm going to stop for just a second and plug in while you focus in on this hope therapy worksheet. And you can take a look at each one of those items that you can then engage in in order to increase your hope. That's the purpose of this hope therapy worksheet. Okay, so when we're looking at this then, we've got these items that we want to um, go through in order to develop more hope in what we can see a domain of interest. So sometimes we have more hope, are less depressed in some areas than other areas. And this also demonstrates that starting behaviors on the simplest level can give us 
initial rewards that will then motivate us to continue building hope in other areas, all right? So it's very important to understand that building small, simple behaviors can actually get us started in changing our body chemistry, our reactions to people and things, and then also that changes our brain chemistry along the line as well. So again, that's why it's so important for us to begin taking a look at smaller behaviors, simpler behaviors that will change our body chemistry even immediately. Okay. All right. So the very first thing, like we said, is pick a domain. You don't want to overwhelm yourself in every domain. Remember what we said. We want to put resources into those domains that um, we have great abilities in, but we don't want to be walking around feeling hopeless either. So how can we then improve our hope in different domains? So there's a series of questions there that you would answer for that domain. And you would also determine your domain here based on the importance that you have, it is in your life, and how much satisfaction it brings. So once again, we are not putting our efforts into domains that really don't give us a lot of feeling of engagement or feelings of flow. Okay, so that is one behavioral technique that you can engage in. Go through the HOPE worksheet. I want to show you a couple things here. I have listed their behavioral change models or behavior change models. And the very first one there is the hope theory and how to change your hope. That's in parentheses there. I have got the authors uh, who basically are um, the... Um, uh, the narrators of that model or who, who have described that model. All right, so taking a look just a little bit more closely at some of the results for this hope behavior change, what we see here is, is we see that behavior change when individuals had the treatment group was significantly greater than when they didn't have the treatment group. And what was the treatment? Well, the treatment was this hope therapy worksheet is what they did. So when individuals engaged in this hope therapy worksheet, what they ended up doing was having a, an effect. What kind of effect size is that? That's a great effect size. Uh, you don't have to know the statistics, but that's a pretty big effect size. And what that effect size is from, so the effect of the treatment was significant. What was the effect size from? The effect size was from agency and pathways. What are they? Well, we ask questions about their beliefs about themselves and built up their belief about themselves. So in building up hope, and answering those questions, one of the things that increased was the belief that individuals had about themselves. The other thing that they also improved on was identifying ways to get there. So both by increasing these identifying ways to get there and a belief that they could accomplish those things, those two components increased individuals' feelings of hope. So this is a really good uh, behavioral change strategy that you might want to think about and engage in. The next model that we're going to focus on is Bandura's self-efficacy model. And when we take a look at this self-efficacy model, there's a few things that we want to think about in his self-efficacy model. So first of all, what we want to do is increase actual performance in the problem area. So first of all, what is self-efficacy? Self-efficacy is the belief that you can do what you set out to do. And so what are ways that we can increase that belief? Well, Bandura identified several ways. And the very first way he, that he identified that we can increase our beliefs in ourselves. That's what we're saying. I believe that if I decide to go back to college, I can get that degree. I believe that if I decide to give up alcohol, I can actually follow through with that. I believe that if I decide to clean my room, I can actually accomplish that. 
Remember, we start these things at all different levels depending on where we feel confident, right? Where What we feel we can accomplish. And, and, and then that increases our feelings of self-efficacy. So the very first thing we said here that Bandura said we needed to do is increase actual performance in problem areas. In problem areas where we feel weak and we feel that we need to uh, improve those areas. So uh, increase our effort in those problem areas is what we need to do. Number two, what, what uh, Bandura said is that we need to model another person's coping strategies. So here we have a chart of Bandura's idea of how we model behavior. And when we model somebody else's behavior, it doesn't really take any effort at all. Children model, um, for example, their favorite superheroes behaviors. And you can see them when they put on their costumes acting out those certain uh, superhero behaviors. It comes very naturally for us to model other people's behaviors. We often see children model their parents' behaviors as well by playing dress up, for example, right? But if we want to try and reduce our depressive behaviors, then what we want to do is make extra efforts to model behaviors of individuals who we know are healthy who do have good coping strategies, who are engaged in life and find passion in their life. Um, and then in modeling those behaviors, what do we want to model? Where do, what do we want to focus on? Well, we might want to focus on areas that increase our hope, right? And model those behaviors that increase individuals' hope. Or what you might want to do is you might want to model individuals' behaviors that are engaged in a certain sport, for example, that you that you enjoy. And so in this way, what this does for you is, is it increases your ability in that area. So that's what you might want to model, right? There are all kinds of ways that we model behaviors. However, if we want to do it successfully, we want to then make sure that we make some conscious efforts at modeling behavior. And that's what this chart shows us. Us. They shows uh, they sh it shows us the steps that we want to go through if we want to consciously model behavior. They're the same steps that we go through if we unconsciously model behavior. The difference is is that we're consciously doing it. So what are we consciously doing? Well, here we're first of all consciously attending to the behaviors that we desire to emulate, right? So we attend and focus on them and watch those individuals. The next thing that we do is we um, think about those behaviors. We analyze those behaviors as how, what kind of behaviors are good for us? What kind of behaviors can we do? What kind of behaviors can't we do? In this sort of an analyzing uh, these behaviors and analyzing the behaviors of other individuals and how they match our behaviors help us retain that information. So working this uh, all out in our heads gives us a feeling of confidence because we have a better understanding of what is going on. And then what do we do? We begin to reproduce those behaviors. And in reproducing those behaviors, we look for some kind of then motivation in the environment where we are not just mentally rehearsing them or physically rehearsing them, but we are actually doing them and have a reason to engage in those coping strategies in the environment. But what we need to do before that, again, is we need to rehearse those over in our minds and then in our bodies as well. Sometimes we need to, to rehearse them by developing specific language that then uh, promotes our behaviors, right? So we, we develop certain language that's positive language about our abilities. And when we develop that language that's positive about our abilities, we begin to feel that positive um, transition into our abilities to actually do it, right? And then finally, what, what we do is when we, when we then 
emulate those behaviors, those positive behaviors in the real world, we assess them. Did that work? Did I reduce my anxiety? Did that make me feel better? How long lasting was that positive feeling, right? We want to capitalize on those behaviors that give us the biggest returns. And the best way to do that is by analyzing those those behaviors that we have cognitively and purposefully implemented. All right. So again, this is great stimulation for our bodies and it's great stimulation for our minds as well. Some of the other important pieces of information that Bandura also told us in order to develop self-efficacy is what we needed to do is engage in verbal persuasion with the helper. So when we are modeling behaviors, what we want to do is, is have individuals challenge our ideas, actually be able to articulate some of our opinions with somebody who might challenge our ideas. So engage in verbal persuasion with a helper. So are you persuasive? Are you aggressive? Do you uh, offend me? Right? And so in this way, what we want to do is we want to be able to uh, again, sharpen our skills so that we can feel more confident so that we can develop a uh, better, uh, so that we can reduce our anxiety about those things we engage in. All right. And then the last thing that Bandura suggested was that we control negative cognitive processes. And we're going to talk more about that when we talk a little bit about rumination. Okay. All right. Now, another set of a third set of behavioral change models came from uh, models that are called self-instructional training models. And these self-instructional training models uh, change things like uh, the way that we cognitively view a problem. So what this, um, this instructional training model talks about is imagining the problem and then again, this focuses in on the inner dialogue that we have when we think about the problem. Is your dialogue negative dialogue? Are you pessimistic about your abilities? And then cognitively assess things like the flow. So is this too challenging for my skill set at this time? What is your inner dialogue when you approach problems? And then again, what you want to focus on is teaching more adaptive dialogue that's more optimistic, but also true to yourself that recognizes your limitations along with your ability to master something. The final model there is called the self-control model. The self-control model focuses on monitoring your own behaviors. So taking a look at what are the antecedents to and the consequences of anxiety. So what preceded your anxiety and then also what were the consequences of that anxiety? Okay, so that's the self-control model. So the very first thing you want to do is take a look at the antecedents and the consequences of of your, uh, for example, anxiety, if that's what you want to try and control, or your depression. Again, I would suggest that you work on the anxiety before you work on the depression. Compare your problematic behavior with a standard. This goes back to Bandura's model. What is the standard that you are looking for? And then compare your behavior to that standard. Are you measuring up to that standard? And then finally, give yourself self-reinforcement. And so give yourself rewards. Remember that you want to increase certain chemi chemistry in your brain. We're going to talk more about what that chemistry is. But in order to do that, you really want to activate that chemistry in your brain. So you want to be aware of the stimulation of reward for you, right? You might want to think about after you have um, um, gotten to a certain goal as far as your anxiety goes, controlling your anxiety, 
predicting the antecedents, writing things down, you get to a certain goal and you have a certain reward for you, yourself. If you want to give yourself a bigger bang for your buck on depression and behavior, the reward that you would have for yourself might likely be something that would, would, would motivate you to engage. So to go out bowling with your friends or to um, cook a dinner with an intimate other, right? To, uh, if it, again, you want to think about things that actually might engage you. You end up attending class 100% of the, of the time for the next three weeks, right? Those things that get you engaged in life are those things that you're going to benefit the most from. Now what I want to show you, are what we have called interventions in the area of psychology and uh, in the area specifically of positive psychology that is focusing on behaviors that will actually increase happiness and reduce depression. And so you can see on these charts that I have here that there are bar graphs for both happiness and depression. The other thing that's here is the type of the other thing listed here is the type of intervention that was used. Here we have the gratitude visit was the intervention. And then what we see here are, we see then increases or decreases in the treatment group, which is the gratitude group, the one that engaged in the intervention, compared to actually not a placebo group, but actually compared to pretest scores. So what they did was they compared individuals who engaged in each one of these interventions and compared them then to their pre-test prior to doing the interventions. There were six interventions that individuals were randomly assigned to engage in. This very first one is called the gratitude visit. And in the gratitude visit, individuals wrote a letter of gratitude to somebody that they hadn't appropriately thanked and hand delivered that letter. Okay, so it's important, first of all, that you are engaging in this exercise in a way that you are actually hand delivering this so that you're getting the biggest benefit from engaging with another person in this exercise. Okay, so that was the very first exercise that I'm presenting here. And in this exercise, we see that individuals had, in fact, the most significant in increases in happiness and the most significant decreases in depression of actually any of the interventions that they engaged in. Um, but you can see here what these numbers indicate is that they are significantly different than the pretest group. But without those significant differences above those columns, that means that they are not different than the pretest group. So what do we see here with a gratitude visit? What we see is, is that we have got uh, short-term increases in happiness and short-term decreases in depression all the way up until uh, one month. However, uh, three months and six months, individuals basically went back to their same levels of happiness and depression. So gratitude visit is good for changes if you want changes in the short term in happiness and depression. Great changes in the short term, but not in the long term. This is the next intervention. They are uh, three good things. And for this intervention, individuals listed three good things that happen to them every day for a week, okay? Three good things that happen to them and the reasons why those things happened. And then we can see that we have had both long-term and short-term significant increases uh, in, dep in uh, happiness and significant decreases in depression. We actually see significant increases in happiness begin actually at the one month mark. But we see decreases in depression happen immediately after the intervention. So individuals wrote three good things that happened to them that day 
and the reasons why they did this for seven days and you can see that it significantly increased their happiness and decreased their depression across six months so that is really encouraging if i want to engage in behaviors that are going to change my uh, happiness and depression this next intervention you at your best individuals wrote a story of them at their best and then they reviewed that story for uh, seven days afterwards so this might have been a story that they had when they were in high school and they may have like caught the winning pass for a touchdown or it may be that they um, asked somebody out on a date and that person said yes and they had the time of their lives so you at your best so individuals wrote this story down and then reviewed this story for the next seven days and you can see here that there really weren't great significant results um, here we had uh, increases in happiness right after the intervention and decreases in depression right after but no significant changes beyond that so thinking about you at a time when you were at your best and reflecting on it actually does not help increase levels of happiness or decrease levels of depression this next intervention is called using signature strengths and using signature strengths you can see that i have two links there to two websites and these websites um, are a place where you can be able to take this uh, character strengths inventory so it's a values in action character strengths inventory and what it will do is is it will rank order your 24 strengths from the top strength that you have uh, to the least uh, the, the lowest strength that you have individuals then uh, after taking this inventory and identifying their top signature strength use their top signature strengths in a new and different way every day for a week the other link that I have there for you is if you decide to take this uh, character inventory of strengths that you can also take a look at some new and different ways that you might be able to use those signature strengths by clicking on that link that I have there for you you can see here that this is the second intervention that increased happiness and decreased depression over the long term so seeing decreases in depression immediately and increases in happiness after one week and for the duration even six months later so individuals who are purposely purposefully using their signature strengths are seeing immediate and long-term increases in happiness and decreases in depression the last chart that i have there for you is just simply um uh, identifying your signature strengths and then kind of keeping them in mind for the next week and what you can see there is is the difference becomes in intention individuals who use their signature strengths and do so in a new and different way benefited significantly from that in increases in happiness and decreases in depression but individuals who didn't focus on using their signature strengths in a new and different way who simply identified them and thought about them you can see did not benefit the same way that those individuals who then tried and consciously engaged in them in a new and different way so hopefully you are beginning to see a pattern here when i'm talking about behavior and depression and moving our way out of de behavior and depression so um, what we are seeing is this trend here that our behaviors then are important especially in consciously engaging in them if we want to change our feelings of depression and anxiety as well okay all right moving on I wanted to show you more one more or actually uh, just a couple more statistics this is one of my last statistics I want to show you uh, as far as engaging in particular behaviors that are helpful in reducing depression and these are specifically focused on the elderly we can see here that we've got two different types of intelligences that are listed here 
One is called or identified. One is uh, identified as crystallized intelligence and the other one is fluid intelligence. The difference here is, is that uh, crystallized intelligence is knowledge that we have for facts. So we, we call that world knowledge sometimes. So uh, who was the first president of the United States? Who emancipated the slaves? What, what is the capital of Alabama? Who is the father of psychoanalysis? So the knowledge that we have, world knowledge, is called crystallized intelligence. Intelligence that we have that in conversation where we are actively paying attention to what somebody's saying as well as drawing from long-term memory, we call that fluid intelligence. It's the intelligence that we need when we're online and we're speaking to one another, right? Typically, when we're speaking to one another, you don't have the same kind of gaps that you have, for example, as I'm recording. Why? Because what I'm doing isn't quite as fluid when I have to worry about technology and things like that, right? So fluid intelligence is the intelligence we use as we are interacting with the environment and with, um, yeah, and living our daily lives, pulling up that intelligence. And what we see here is, is that um, we have greater mental ability in old age. In fact, we barely use, uh, lose our crystallized intelligence in older age. But what we do is we do lose our fluid intelligence. And what we did here was we had individuals, even though this is a small chart and you're not worried about it, you can see that the blue bars are much bigger than the orange bars. And that's what we want to focus on then. That is where individuals increased their fluid intelligence, the blue line, when individuals engaged in regular conversations with other individuals. And so if you want to decrease depression, in particular in elderly, what you want to do is increase feelings of self-efficacy, for example, by having regular conversations with the elderly. And so if you're worried about dementia, if you're worried about Alzheimer's in your loved one, the best thing that you can do is call them up, communicate with them, write letters, do FaceTime with them, whatever it takes to get them to use their fluid intelligence. What that blue line is showing you in that chart is, is prefrontal cortex activity when individuals engaged in practicing fluid intelligence. So again, you can make a conscious effort to be using even our knowledge and intellectual faculties that will increase feelings of happiness, and decrease feelings of depression. So please, if you have to write a letter, maybe write it to one of your grandparents. It will really improve their their emotional well-being and, the, and their subjective well-being, their, their levels of happiness. All right, and then this actually, I believe, is the last slide that I want to talk to you about, about some specific behaviors. And these are specific behaviors that are related to giving behaviors. What we see here is a study that's been done and it's been duplicated several times and replicated several times by um, a researcher whose last name is Acknin. And you can look this up. Also, Hamilton has also done research in this area. And what they're looking at here is they're looking at children. And the dark bars here are children... It, the dark bars here are representing an earlier study and the gray bars here are representing a later study where they included more variables. And so you can see there in the earlier study, what they were looking at is they gave children um, were sharing a toy or children were playing with the toy. And we can see there then the dependent variable, the outcome of interest, what were we measuring is what I'm talking about. What were we looking for? What outcome were we looking for? Well, we were looking for general levels of happiness. And this was recorded by individuals who were observing behaviors. And these individuals are blind to the study. They don't know other people are also observing behaviors and also marking those behaviors. So observers observed behaviors in the first study where you can see children who shared a toy were significantly happier than individuals who just simply played with the toy or children who played with the toy. 
And the gray bars, what we have here is happiness that's related to meeting a puppet. So children were introduced to a puppet. Children also received treats. And then you can see here that the children were allowed to give treats to the puppet. They saw the experimenter give treats to the puppet. They gave treats that were found to the puppet or they gave their own treats to the puppet. And you can see here that there, were, there was more enjoyment in giving those, even if I saw somebody else give a treat to the puppet, than there was in actually receiving my own treats. And so we can see here that if we want to change depression through behavior, one thing that we might want to also try doing is giving to individuals. We know study after study has demonstrated that we gain more from giving than we do from receiving. And so again, take note of those things though. One of the things that's different about adult coping strategies compared to childhood coping strategies is that childhood coping strategies typically are automatic. They're unconscious. The difference with adult coping strategies is that we should try and engage in them consciously. We want to try and purposefully engage in these behaviors. And then in doing so, we want to also determine whether or not they have made a difference, which behaviors have made a real difference. You can also go to an authentic happiness website, which is where a lot of this literature is located. So www.authentichappiness.com. And on the Authentic Happiness website, you can see many of the inventories that individuals um, have developed in order to measure things like uh, optimism, our, our values, our character strengths, uh, to measure things like I talked about, like grit, for example. And you can take a look at what you're scoring on those and then see whether or not some of these interventions, for example, or giving makes some kind of a difference in your levels of happiness and satisfaction with life. Savoring is a concept that I like to encourage individuals to also consciously develop. And in developing these consciously, what you might want to do is make a plan for, you can see there, reliving a positive event in your mind. So make a plan to do that. And think about that, that event then and reliving that event in positive ways. Think about all the details of that positive event. Savoring is creating things like awe, and wonder. It's also creating a new and different way for you to be able to see an experience. Let me give you an example. When we plan for an experience, let's say for an important, let's say we want to go out um, and uh, go to the apple, go to an apple cider, go to an apple cider mill. So this way we're engaging in life, all right? So making the plan increases levels of our dopamine because we anticipate this. I talked a little bit about this last week. We anticipate the event, and in anticipating the, the event, we increase our dopamine. It motivates us then to continue on to make sure we go through the engagement, make sure that we go through to the cider mill, right? That anticipation and that excitement encourages us, motivates us to go to the cider mill. So you can see how we can increase motivation by thinking about a planned event. We can also then recreate those reward centers and stimulation of those reward centers in our brain by savoring the event afterwards. That's spending time thinking about the event. And even sometimes if the event didn't go as planned, in our savoring attempt, in our savoring exercise, what we, we might want to try and do is think about all the positive things that still did occur. Even if the event didn't turn out the way we wanted, we can still savor the event by thinking about something positive about it.
I have my students actually engage in this exercise where they plan an event, see about their anticipation and excitement, if that changes their levels of, for example, dopamine, but then also savor, plan to savor the event. Somebody planned to savor the event by actually posting their um, uh, their their um, they actually had uh, a recipe, so they actually had made dinner. So they po posted their dinner that they had made on social media, and that was a way of savoring the event. That was an excellent use of social media, and it was an ex excellent way to savor the event. In this way, we also increase dopamine, but we increase serotonin as well when we savor the event. And in this way, I've had many students say that even though they were disappointed that it didn't work out the way that they wanted it to, the initial event, that in savoring, that was the time that they actually determined that it was actually more positive than they thought. So they would have never experienced a more positive spin on savoring. They had never developed a more positive spin on the event had they not planned to savor. So again, another way that we make a conscious effort in order to really benefit from those things in life that we enjoy and that we plan to enjoy. Okay, I want to talk about then, now what I said was I was going to talk about engagement, I was going to talk about the placebo effect, I was going to talk about positive behaviors, and I just gave you a whole list of positive behaviors and the outcomes for those positive behaviors. I also said I wanted to wrap this up by focusing a little bit on negative behaviors. And negative behaviors here begin with what's called the hedonic treadmill. And oftentimes, when we are trying to satisfy ourselves, when we are trying to find a way to fill that void in our lives, we end up looking for things instead of looking for things uh, like that will make us feel better, internal rewards. What we end up more often doing is looking at external rewards. And, and when we look at external rewards, what we end up doing then is reverting back to our same levels of emotions we had before. So let's say that we are depressed and we decide that what we want to do is we want to go out and get buy something, even if it's an exercise piece of equipment here, right, that will make us feel better. So we see it. We want it, we buy it, it changes our level of happiness for a while, but when we're on the hedonic treadmill, what we end up doing is typically adapting back to our same level of happiness. This is an automatic process that can only be broken typically by conscious processes that then refocus our attention off of things and focus our attention on things like eudaimonic happiness, purpose, meaning, flow, engagement. Those kinds of things take greater effort. However, in the long run, they give us a much bigger bang for our buck in changing our levels of happiness and depression much more immediately. So let's take a look at what ends up happening when we get on that hedonic treadmill in a negative way. What we end up doing is ruminating, and this is reliving a negative event in your mind over and over. And very often, this begins unconsciously. As we try and problem solve and get our problems out of the way, what we end up doing is going down a path of um, what ifs. What if that didn't happen? What if I had more money? What if I had a partner who loved me? What if I was divorced? What if I had children? What if I didn't have children? What if I had a bigger home? And we begin going down this path, oftentimes because we think we're solving our problem. But instead, what we're doing is, is we are creating cognitive pathways that are being used 
and reused so that when we have an instigation in the environment, like we were talking about with Bandura and modeling the behaviors, what ends up happening is, is we have an a, an instigation in the environment that instead of setting off modeled coping strategies, ends up setting off a frenzy of uh, sympathetic act, nervous system activation like we had talked about. So increase in heart rate, increase in blood pressure. We end up having uh, adrenal glands secrete corticosteroids, which end up increasing our heart rate for, for the long term, and then also ends up having us store resources that are unnecessary because we're not using them, such as sugar, fats, carbohydrates, and proteins as well. What this ends up doing then is creating great dysfunction between our nervous system and our endocrine system, which is also known as our hormonal system, right? And then when we do this, this also activates and creates dysfunction in our neurotransmitters. We're going to talk more about these processes next week when we talk about antidepressants, in particular neurotransmitters. But what I wanted to get you to understand here is that behavior instigates and thinking and rumination instigates these behavioral patterns and these thinking and neurological patterns as well as these chemical patterns. And when you begin then down a road of rumination, it doesn't take a lot if that's where you've been hanging to have all of these negative physiological reactions activated. So if you had a bad experience at work with your boss and it was an injustice, and you continue to think about this injustice so that it makes you so angry with where you work, it makes you so angry with who you work with, and you want to lash out, but you know that you can't. Think about what that is doing to your nervous system when you want to lash out, but you can't. And in activating that nervous system, we know that we activate chemistry in our brains, neurotransmitters, and our hormonal system. So whenever you feel that anxiety, know that you are releasing those hormones and neurotransmitters that instigate and keep that feeling of anxiety active within you. So that's why it takes conscious, purposeful behavior to think differently, develop hope, develop feelings of self-efficacy. And when we think about this, um, these cognitive uh, pathways, you can think about these cognitive pathways in like they are an interstate. And on an interstate highway, you get lots of activity on the main highways. They are used over and over again. And therefore, they are very well worn. You're used to those areas. Nobody has to tell you how to get to work because you've done it a thousand times. That is a well worn area, uh, a a neuronal highway in your brain that is used a lot. When you ruminate, the same kinds of things occur. You create a super highway in your brain for those negative thoughts. And again, only one thing, small thing in the environment needs to trigger you for you to be able to get an entryway onto that super highway, that negative super highway in your brain. Okay? And because it's a superhighway, there are all kinds of entrances onto the superhighway. Unfortunately, you have to make a cognitive effort to get off of that neuronal anxiety-producing superhighway. Okay, so that wraps it up for today's session with the exception of today's question. And that wraps it up for today, except for today's question. And today's question I have specifically for you. And that is, I would like to know what your 
what you are going to do actually in order to begin your very first step for creating behaviors that get you out of depression and very specifically the question is is what are your top top five signature strengths and how might you use them in a new and different way to get you out of your depressive behaviors so i encourage you to take the via character strengths inventory i will have the uh, website up there but you can go back and you can see the website that is there i'll have the, a link up there for you scrolling when i edit the video um so tell me what your top five signature strengths are. Share those with me, either through email. You can email me at drfarovich at healthymindbodyspirit.net. So email me your top five signature strengths and how you have decided to use them in a new and different way. So that's my question for you. How are you going to apply some of the things that you learned regarding behaviors in order to help walk yourself out of this kind of depressive, um, to help walk yourself out of depression? So I am Dr. Annette Farovich with Healthy Mind, Body, Spirit. You can, you can find me on the internet at www.healthymindbodyspirit. Be, sure. Be sure to check out my therapy that I have available and also find out more about nutrition. I'm going to be talking more and more about nutrition as we move along because I feel that um, individuals really are not well informed about things like vitamin D since our practitioners do not regularly check for that and the differences in vitamin D levels that are, and the difference that vitamin D and the different levels make in our ability to be able to fight things like depression and even things like improve our immune system and also fight things like cancer. So be sure to check out my nutrition page for more information and be sure to email me if you have any questions about mental health or nutrition. And join us next week, October 31st on Halloween episode number three on antidepressants. And then remember that we've got the rest of the schedule up there. So please be sure to join me and thank you for joining me and I will see you all next week.